graduate a nursing student and a couple of exciting announcements. One is that this podcast is going to be done more regularly now. I am also going to be making it even better for you guys. This is the last podcast you're going to hear on this awful microphone. So after this episode, it should be sounding pretty darn sweet. So you have that to look forward to. And my goal right now is to put out a new episode every Wednesday. Um, That might change to Thursdays depending on my work schedule, but I will certainly let you know. And then one thing I do want to talk about before we dive into it is that I get a lot of emails and comments on the Straight A Nursing Student website where people say, I'm failing a class, how do I study for X class, be it med surg, be it a and be it uh, microbiology, chemistry, OB, PEDS, whatever, how do I study? Guys, I want you to know that I have answered that question in excruciating detail in my book, Nursing School Thrive Guide, which you can get on Amazon as a paperback or an ebook, soon to be also an audiobook. So that's super exciting. So if you really want to dive into how do I study, what's the most effective way to study, how do I really survive and thrive in nursing school and even in pre nursing, get the book. It is awesome. You can also look through the website. There's a post called Find a Study Method That Works. So if you search for the term study method, that will come up and that has some good information too. So I just wanted to put that out there because I do get a lot of questions about that. So what are we talking about today? Today we will be talking about diabetes. And the reason I wanted to talk about diabetes today is because it really is something that you're going to see a lot. Um, Not only is it heavily focused on in your MedSearch 1 class, but you'll see it a ton in clinical. You'll see it a ton uh, when you're working as a nurse. I'm not going to say most patients that you come across will have diabetes. It really depends on the patient population that you're dealing with. But I would say a whole heck of a lot of them will have diabetes. And of those group that have diabetes, I would say most of them are type 2 adult onset diabetes. So today we'll be talking about that and hopefully you will be able to rock your exams when it comes to diabetes and feel really confident and clinical when you're taking care of these patients. So if you want more information about this, the Straight A Nursing Student website does have a post about diabetes. I think it's called When Sugar Attacks. So you can search for that and find that there as well, which it also includes kind of a a printable little cheat sheet that you can use and put in your notebook so that you can reference it. Okay, so what are the basics about diabetes? Let's talk first about just the normal physiology in your body. So blood glucose levels go up for lots of reasons. Um, When you eat, obviously, blood glucose levels are going to go up. When you're under stress, and even some medications that you take will cause your blood glucose to rise. So when this happens, the pancreas excretes insulin in response. And if you remember from your physiology class, the insulin is like a key that will unlock the cell so that the glucose can go into the cell where it provides energy. If the glucose is outside of the cell, In the vascular space, it is physiologically inactive. It is not doing your body any good. It is, in fact, doing your body a fair amount of harm, and in some cases, a great amount of harm. So let's talk now about some of the pathophysiology in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, which is the insulin-dependent diabetes, the pancreas just isn't producing any insulin or isn't producing insulin as it should. So this can be idiopathic, meaning don't really know why it happened, or it can be related to an autoimmune disease where the body has attacked those beta cells in the pancreas. Note that type 1 diabetes is not always the juvenile onset. I have seen type 1 diabetes as adult onset with the cases of someone who's maybe had some kind of autoimmune issue or a virus that affects the pancreas and then bam, suddenly they're type one diabetic. Type two diabetes, again, this is the one that you'll see the most often. In this type, there's either not enough insulin being released or very commonly, 
the cells in your body are resistant to the insulin, making it more difficult for the insulin to um, act as that key and unlock the cell so that the glucose can go in. So in both types, you're gonna have blood sugar or glucose not entering the cell, instead builds up in the blood, causing problems like organ damage, blindness, you'll see a lot of neuropathic pain, which is this like nerve pain in the, mostly you'll see it in hands and feet in people. In severe cases, you'll see it present as DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis or HHS, which is hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state, both of which can be fatal. So let's talk real quick about some of our normal ranges. What is a normal blood sugar? Do you remember any of this? Yes, a normal blood sugar is considered 80 to 110, 80 to 120, somewhere around there. Um, in the hospital setting, we don't shoot so much for a blood sugar that's 80 to 120 because they found that people were overshooting that and causing instances of hypoglycemia, which in the acute phase is much more dangerous than being a little bit on the higher side. So we typically try to keep people in the hospital under 150. Um, you will be considered diabetic if your symptoms are present and your blood sugar is greater than or equal to 200. If you have a fasting blood sugar greater than or equal to 126 measured on a couple of different occasions, you would be considered diabetic at that point. Um, one of the things that will be tested is a HbA1c or maybe it's sometimes you might just hear it called an A1c and this is a measure of the it measures the kind of like the stickiness of the red blood cell and if you recall a red blood cell's lifespan is about three months so it measures the stickiness of that red blood cell which tells you on average what was the blood sugar over the past three months the goal is less than seven percent You'll have patients that say, oh, I've been following my diet, I've been taking my insulin, and their A1C is 11. And so you know that they're not being 100% truthful with you. So how do we treat diabetes? Mainly, you're going to be giving insulin to treat diabetes. There are also oral agents, and we'll talk a little bit about those as well. So um, the insulins that you're gonna see the most often are like Novolog, Humalog, your short acting insulins. These are the ones that you give right before a meal and it corrects the blood sugar quickly and with these, the patient has kind of these ups and downs. You'll also see Lantus a lot. Now Lantus is a long acting insulin. It's given every 24 hours and there's some new ones on the market and it has the funniest commercial and it's called Traceba. And if you've seen the commercial, you'll just crack up and you'll be singing the song and that goes with it all day. But this is a another long acting type of insulin and I'm going to butcher how it's pronounced, but it's called an insulin degludec. And the interesting thing about this is that it has kind of flexible dosing. So it's a daily injection. Whereas the Lantus, you pretty much need to take on the nose every 24 hours. This one, you can be a little bit flexible with the dosing as long as there's at least eight hours in between dose. I believe it says on the Traceba website that um, eight to 40 hours kind of wiggle room with the dosing of that. So for people who have maybe varying work schedules or difficulty maintaining that exact time of day dosing, maybe Traceba would be something that they could look at. Okay, so insulin, that's kind of the mainstay. There's also oral agents. Um, what we have here in this category, we have the sulfonyl, I'm gonna butcher all of these, sulfonylureus and megalotenides. Wow, um, these stimulate the pancreas to secrete insulin. Um, gliburide is a common one that I've seen in this category. Some people take a starch blocker. I don't see this that often, but this you would take at the beginning of a high carb meal to inhibit the enzymes that break down the carbohydrates. A common one is a carbose. I'm probably again butchering the names of all of these. One of the most common oral agents that you'll see is metformin. It's a biguanide class and this decreases glucose in the liver the production of glucose in the liver rather while increasing the cell's ability to utilize glucose 
and it's typically used in the early stages of type 2 diabetes. Um, the one thing that you want to be aware of if your patient is on metformin is that they cannot have any contrast dye um, anywhere within 48 hours of a dose of metformin. So you would want to hold the metformin for a little bit before procedure and for a bit after the procedure, mainly 48 hours. Like say if they're going for a CT scan that requires contrast dye. There are insulin sensitizers, which make the insulin receptors on the cells more sensitive to the insulin. This would be great for the person who is insulin resistant. These are um, a common one is Actos or Avandia. There's also DDP4 inhibitors and GLP1 analogs, which inhibit gluc glucagon release. They stimulate insulin release in the pancreas, and they can also help a little bit with weight loss. Uh, a common one here is Vildegliptin and Liraglitude. These kind of sound like medieval characters. And then there's a newer drug class, the SGLT2 inhibitor class. I think it was just approved by the FDA in 2015. Uh, it's a sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitor. And basically the short version of this is that it, it takes excess blood glucose and excretes it out in the urine. So a couple of things you want to watch for with this is that you can, in women, have a higher incidence of yeast infections just from the higher sugar kind of in that area, happy place for yeast. And I am not 100% on the mechanism of action for this drug, but it can cause increased mag, increased FOS, and even an increased hematocrit. One of the benefits is that it can cause a little bit of weight loss. So those are some of the drugs that you're going to see most common. I would say metformin, I would say short-acting insulins, and Lantus, though there are some, other, some others out there. Now, let's talk a little bit about DKA, or diabetic ketoacidosis. You'll see this a lot if you work in the emergency room or if you work in a medical ICU, you're going to get DKA patients. And basically the DKA diagnostic criteria is a blood sugar over 250, a pH less than 7.3, a serum bicarb less than 15, and ketones present. So DKA is life-threatening. It usually affects the type 1 diabetic. Your blood glucose, again, is going to be very high, and the ketones will be moderate to severe, and this will be measured in the blood or the urine. Typically, you'll see a blood glucose of 300 to 800, and some early symptoms of DKA are polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria, headache and fatigue. So that might be what your patient's feeling early on. They might say, oh, I felt really tired for a couple days, I was really thirsty. Later symptoms of DKA are nausea and vomiting. That fatigue will worsen to become extreme. They could have the Kuzmal respirations. There will be weight loss, dehydration. These patients are extremely dehydrated. CNS depression and decreased LOC. They could go into that diabetic coma. So the pathophysiology of DKA pretty much goes like this. There's not enough insulin, and the cells in the body don't get the energy they need as this blood glucose is building up in the blood. The liver thinks, hey, my body needs more energy. My cells are starving. So I'm going to convert glycogen to glucose and fats and proteins into glucose. So I'm going to make glucose however I can. Cells need energy. So if there's also the use of fatty acids for energy, which is what the liver's doing, leads to a buildup of ketones while the serum glucose levels go up even higher. As this occurs, serum osmolarity goes up. Remember, your osmotic gradients, serum osmolarity goes up, fluids are going to be pulled from the cell as the body tries to balance that out. Remember, again, your gradient of osmolarity. The intracellular dehydration, okay, your cells are being depleted of their fluid, causes this catecholamine response, which further stimulates all of this gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis and lipolysis to make more glucose released into the bloodstream. Now the kidneys cannot handle all this glucose and they just start dumping urine. They just start dumping urine and now here's some of the ketones start to come out. 
this diuresis continues and the fluid losses can be really, really great. With fluid loss, you know that you're going to have electrolyte imbalances and dehydration. Okay, as you get dehydrated, your hyperosmolarity is going to go up even more. Okay, you guys starting to see there's kind of a big cycle here. Your hyperosmolarity goes up even more and these acidic ketones continue building up in the blood. Dehydration, acidosis get even worse. As the kidneys get taxed, the GFR decreases and the kidneys can't handle all this excess glucose. So your serum glucose levels go up even more. Acidosis gets worse, leading to shock, coma, and death. So that's basically the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis. So your patient comes into the ED and is complaining of maybe they're already in their, their diabetic coma in your note in the Kuzmo Respirations family says, yeah, he's been really thirsty, feeling really badly the last day or two, and here we are. So you might think the very first thing you're going to do is pop insulin into this patient. Actually, the very first thing you're going to do is get a large bore IV in there and fluid resuscitate this patient. They are extremely dangerously dehydrated. They will get up to six liters often, I've seen many times. If uh, you're working in the ED and you're Patient care plan is not including aggressive fluid resuscitation. You need to speak to your physician about that. This patient needs fluids. Now, they will be put on an insulin drip. This is a continuous infusion of insulin, meaning you're going to be checking their blood sugar every hour. That's why these patients go to ICU. Um, they are way too time intensive to be on the reg regular floor and they need to be monitored very closely. So their insulin drip will be initiated. There is a protocol. It will be specific to your institution for how much you started at, where you titrated, etc. Just know that your goal, and this will be on your tests, I guarantee it, is to decrease blood sugar by about 70, 70, my goodness, 50 to 70 milligrams per deciliter an hour. Faster than that is bad, okay? So keep that in mind. About 50 to 70 megaliter, milligrams per deciliter. I swear I've had my coffee today, guys every hour. Once your blood sugar gets below like 250 in that 200 to 250 range, your IV fluids are going to switch. Maybe they were on NS before. Now they're going to go to something with a little bit of glucose. And the reason for this is that we want to prevent hypoglycemia. Remember I mentioned earlier that in the clinical setting, hypoglycemia is avoided as much as possible because it is so dangerous. So usually what you'll be switching them over to is D5W with 0.45% in ACL. Um, this will be part of your protocol order. Usually it's not something that you have to go and ask the doc about as your blood glucose decreases. Usually it's part of the DKA order set. So you just have to be aware of that and make that judgment call when the blood glucose gets to that range. You will be monitoring lots of things. These patients typically get a chemistry panel every four hours. You're going to monitor that anion gap, the serum osmolality, the BUN, the creatinine, sodium, and potassium. Why so much the potassium? This is a very key thing that you're going to watch. As insulin unlocks the cell, okay, and takes the sugar into the cell, potassium hops along with that sugar and goes into the cell which leads to hypokalemia. So you're gonna be monitoring your potassium a lot. And then I mentioned the anion gap. What is an anion gap, you ask? Basically, this is, it measures positive and negative electrolytes. So it's gonna be your sodium minus your chloride and bicarb. So your sodium is a positive and your chloride and bicarb are negatives. So add together your chloride and bicarb, whatever that number is, Subtract that from your sodium, and normally you'll have you want it to be eight to twelve. So a lot of times when you are talking to the physician about getting them off the insulin drip and starting them on their regular insulin regimen, they will ask, "Is the anion gap closed?" And when that value is eight to twelve, the anion gap is considered closed. Okay. So note that some of these values are going to change by institution. These are ballpark figures that are pretty common, but always, of course, check with your institution and with whatever your professor says is going to be on the test. But these are the general principles. 
okay, so then the other big diabetes crisis that you'll see in the clinical setting is HHS. I didn't see this quite as often as I saw DKA. Hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar state. You will also sometimes see it referred to as HHNKS, which is hyperglycemic, hyperosmolar non-ketotic syndrome. So this occurs in type 2 diabetes. It's also fatal if left untreated. The key difference between the two is that in HHS, the fluid losses are often higher. They're even more dehydrated. The blood glucose often higher. They do not have ketosis or it is very mild. In HHS, there is not, not the utilization of fats and proteins for energy. So a few differences. The main diagnostic criteria for HHS is a blood sugar above 600. I've seen blood sugars as high as 900, 1200. Uh, pH greater than 7.3. Recall that in DKA, the pH was less than 7.3. So this does not have the alkalosis. It has an alkalosis. Serum bicarb is greater than 15, whereas in DKA, it was less than 15. So things kind of go the other direction in HHS. And the serum osmolality will be higher than 320. Again, mild or no ketones. So what happens in the pathophysiology of HHS? Just like in DKA, it all starts with inadequate insulin. So the cells don't have the energy they need and glucose is building up in the blood this whole time. Now the liver, again, thinks, hey, my body doesn't have any energy, I'm gonna help out. So the liver converts glycogen, which is the stored form of glucose, into glucose. So the liver converts glycogen to glucose and your serum glucose levels will go up even more. Now, as this happens, the serum osmolarity goes up and as you recall, your osmolarity gradients will cause fluid to be pulled from inside the cell into the vascular space, leading to intracellular dehydration. Now, the kidneys can't handle all the glucose that's spilling over into the urine, so you have a lot of diuresis, and the fluid losses can be enormous. With this comes electrolyte imbalances and dehydration, hyperosmolarity, increases even more. Now the body tries to offset this diuresis by releasing ADH, but it's too late. The dehydration worsens, you get hypovolemia, which reduces renal perfusion, and we all know the kidneys love to be perfused. GFR is gonna go down, and oliguria results. The kidneys just aren't able to excrete glucose as effectively. The sympathetic nervous system kicks in, releases epinephrine in response to all of this stress, and the serum glucose levels go up even more. So this cycle just perpetuates and continues. You get this very hemoconcentrated blood, which leads to possible clot formation, infarcts in the brain, the heart, the lungs, while the central nervous system dysfunction leads to, you guessed it, shock, coma, and death. So that is the pathophilic theology of HHS, and you can see how serious both of these conditions are. Now, how are we going to treat HHS? Again, first thing, you got to get a large bore IV in these patients and rapidly fluid resuscitate them. In HHS, you will typically be giving 7 to 10 liters of fluid. That's a lot of fluid. As you give this fluid, you will be monitoring serum sodium because you're giving them an ACL, right? Uh, the fluids may need to be changed to something hypotonic if the serum sodium rises too much. Generally, when the blood glucose reaches that 200 to 250 range, the fluids are changed to D5W with half NS, just kind of like in um, DKA. You will be putting them on an insulin drip with the goal, again, of dropping blood glucose how much every hour? 50 to 70 every hour, perfect. You're gonna monitor the blood glucose levels hourly. You will monitor their electrolytes with a chemistry panel probably every four hours. This may differ depending on where you work, but you're especially gonna be watching the potassium, the phos, and the sodium like a hawk. I would probably be looking at the magnesium as well. You will monitor urine output, serum osmolality, BUN, and creatinine. If the patient's in hypovolemic shock, which they very well could be, they may have CVP monitoring or central venous pressure monitoring. And as you are fluid resuscitating them, you do wanna watch for signs of fluid overload, which would be 
the very first thing you'd be concerned about is a wet sound in the lungs and decreased O2 saturation levels. So I mentioned this insulin drip every hour, checking their blood sugar every hour while they're on the insulin drip. The very best practice that I've seen that I do is when you set your pump, let's say you've checked their blood sugar and it's 350 and on your algorithm that is eight units of insulin an hour. Program in your eight units of insulin as your dose, so your rate, it's usually a one milligram per uh, one mil relationship, so it's one to one, so it'll be eight mils an hour that they're getting. And then for your volume to be infused, don't put in what you think is in the bag, like, you know, 90 mils, put in eight milliliters. That way the pump will beep at you when your hour is up and you know to go back in and check another blood sugar. For me, that is the only way that I can stay on top of my hourly blood sugar checks. Um, a lot of people don't do this. I don't know how they stay on top of it, but an hour in the ICU or in the emergency department goes by crazy fast and setting your pump for the volume to be infused only what you absolutely need so that it sets that reminder to recheck their blood sugar is key. So that's a little tip for the day. Okay, so um, you're going to educate the heck out of your patient because they got here because their diabetes got out of control. So a lot of times, though, it could be a new diagnosis for them. They just felt sick and they didn't know why and they came in on DKA or HHS and this is all new. This patient is going to require a lot of education. Remember one of the things, one of the very first things that you do with educating your patient is you determine their readiness for education and the be best method for that patient. So readiness would be they have just been diagnosed, they're in total shock. I had a patient, granted she was emotionally quite immature, but still it was a big, big shock to her. She cried pretty much nonstop for a good day and a half. Um, so her readiness to learn about how to manage her disease was not there. Um, so you wanna make sure that they're ready to learn. And the things that you're gonna teach them is how to take a blood sugar. So as you're checking their blood sugar using your glucometer, talk through what you're doing, explain it. You could even get to the point where they do it themselves. You will be teaching them how to calculate their correct dosage. Again, just as you're doing it, talk about what you're doing. You can introduce topics just that way and then start having them participate and practice. You could have them practice drawing up saline. You could have them practice injecting an orange is a common thing or a stack of gauze pads or something. You want to be teaching them when to take their blood sugar, when to take their insulin, uh, when to take their oral meds. Another big thing, and dietary is probably the one that, or the diabetic education will go into a lot more detail with them on this, is how to calculate their carbohydrates, how to make good food choices. Um, a lot of DKA patients, you'll check their blood sugar right after their visitors left, and it's super high, and you just know they brought them in something to eat that they shouldn't be having. You want to teach about the importance of exercise. Exercise helps the body use up kind of that excess glucose. Uh, foot care, big one with diabetics is that they have the neuropathic foot pain, the decreased sensation in their feet. Foot care is something that's definitely going to be on your exams. You would not soak a diabetic foot, say, in a foot spa because then the skin becomes macerated and prone to infection. You would want to leave the feet wet. They have to dry carefully between their toes. They need to wear socks all the time, even with sandals. I know it's so sad, but they should not be walking around in flip-flops like some people I know. Um, they should be wearing socks at all times, hopefully with not sandals, not because that looks awful, but because they could still get pebbles or things in there. They want to be wearing actual well-fitting shoes. So those are some of the things about foot care. They should be checking visually their feet daily to make sure they haven't stepped on something because they won't feel it, and then you get a huge foot ulcer there. You want to teach the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. And one of the other huge, huge things is sick day protocol. So again, remember, when your body's under stress, it's going to produce more glucose. And being sick is stress. So every diabetic patient should understand what their sick day protocol is. 
and sick could be. They've got the flu. Um, they're under the weather for any reason at all. They need to instigate sick day protocol. And what this is, is they will be checking the blood sugar every two to four hours, so more frequently than usual, with the goal blood sugar of less than 200. Okay, they're also going to check for ketones if they're a diabetic type 1. They will eat small meals often and drink a lot of fluids that do not contain sugar, so drinking water basically. So they want to stay hydrated, they want to check their blood sugar more frequently and shoot for a goal of less than 200. They're going to call their doctor if their blood sugar is greater than 240 for more than 24 hours, if they have any vomiting or diarrhea, if they have severe pain, if their ketones are moderate to large, and they have any neurological symptoms. So hopefully they can get in to see someone before they go into full-fledged DKA or HHS. Okay, so that is your basics for diabetes. I hope you found that extremely helpful, and I can't wait to do the next podcast for you guys on a decent sounding microphone. I already hate the sound of my voice, so hopefully it'll be a little bit better with the new equipment that should be here any day now. And again, if you need extra help, check out the Nursing School Thrive Guide available on Amazon as an ebook or a paperback and soon to be an audiobook. Super excited about that. And go to the website, go to straightynursingstudent.com. Look around. There's a ton of stuff there, not just my notes from nursing school, which are amazing, but just blog posts about whatever, you know, whatever I find interesting that week is typically what I write about. But do a search in the search bar. Look for things. Look at the tags. Um, if you're a newer nursing student or pre-nursing student, look for the things that are tagged basics. Look for the things that are tagged advanced if you're in your med search too and getting ready to do your ICU rotations. So again, I hope all of this helps. Please write in with your suggestions for other podcast episodes, other ideas for blog posts, or anything that you would find helpful. And have a fantastic day. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.